little piece of binding a little bit loose here on the edge, so I've re-glued that and got that. That's why this cloth is on there. While that's drying, uh, I thought I might as well start fitting up this bridge. I bought this bridge just off of eBay. I was looking for an ebony one. They didn't have an ebony one, but this was a very dark rosewood, and I can dye this black. I'm not so worried about the color as I was more that it looked the part. You know, it. so many of these bridges just don't look like they belong at all. This one kind of looks the part. Um, you know, it's as close as I could find, and it was only $10, so it's like, it's a no-brainer at that point. So, I just thought I'd show you, here's the one that came with it, and, you know, it's just, it just doesn't look the part at all, you know, I mean, it just isn't the right shape or size or anything. At least this one kind of looks like an old Gibson bridge to a lot of, de you know, to some degree. And the, the little uh, adjusters are about the right size. And so I think this is a much better fit. Um, the, the feet on it don't quite fit the top, so I'm working them down with some sandpaper. When you see the sanding get all the way across, see like it's not touching here and here yet then you know you got it. And I'm sure I've said this before in videos, but whenever I'm a fitting a, an adjustable bridge of any type to the top, whether it's mandolin, violin, whatever, I always put a little bit, Now I don't want you to go to extremes, but I always put a little bit more pressure on the backside because the bridges are always walking and pulling forward. So it's a, you know, it's just a good idea to have them fit where they just may be a fraction of a hair, you know, past center that way in terms of vertical. Just that they're just leaning back just a slight amount. And then what I do after I do that and get it fitted pretty close, I take a, a small file and I knock at a 45 these edges. And I just, I round them over just slightly. I mean, you really, by looking at it, you can't hardly tell it, but you can feel it. It's not near as sharp as this one. This one here will almost cut you, it's that sharp. And you just round off that little corner a little bit. Now, why would I do that? Because it'll leave less chance of leaving a mark on your top. That looks pretty good. This is the B string on this, and the reason I know that is because it's offset to the back just a little bit. So this is the way it goes. That really does look good. It, it looks like it's fitting on there really tight. So that ought to work. Well, now we'll just wait till this has a little more time to dry, and we'll get the tuning keys on here and get her set up. The camera cut off for some reason. I'm not sure why and where it left off at, but so I'm going to catch up here. Uh, I'm talking about these rivets and these rivet holes. The modern one has just two rivets. The old ones used to have a rivet at four points on each tuning uh, tuner. So this one only has two, and they're flush. Well, pretty flush. They, you can, they stick up a little bit, but not enough to make a difference. The old ones used to, because the rivets were much bigger, they actually cut holes around each, you know, for each rivet around each post. So that's why there's so many more holes there. I'm not going to fill the rivet holes. I'm only going to fill the screw holes. Just thought I'd show you that I did fill all the holes, and I used toothpicks. The last time I did this, and, and of course those holes were even bigger than these, although these took a lot of toothpicks as well. Um, someone said, well, you should use something you know, bigger, like you know, some people said they use chopsticks, they use different things. Now, you know, and I've used a lot of different things over the years too. I've got some real tiny dowels in the other room that I could use, but I go back to toothpicks. Now here's why. Because almost never are these holes exactly round. If they were exactly round, then a dowel of the exact size would be the easy way to fill it. But these holes are almost always elongated, weird shapes. Some of them are L-shaped. Some of them, you know, I mean, they're in every kind of configuration you can imagine. 
And the thing about the toothpicks is, that's fail safe, is you jam them down in the hole, break it off, jam it down in the hole, break it off, jam it down, and you keep jamming them in there till it's tighter than a bull's butt at fly time. And you can just jam as many toothpicks as you want and it will get just as tight to the point, to the point where I'm actually the last ones I put in, and I'm not, I'm just demonstrating. But the last ones I put in, I actually drive in with the end of the screwdriver. So these are in there, very tight, lots of glue, will never come out. Just as a brief review, these are the tuners that came with the guitar, and hopefully you can see that they're really cheap ones. Um, you know, these, this is one piece of metal, and then the flaps are folded up and bent over these things here so they're really cheaply made they work and they're fine i mean for a cheap guitar and everything but they're really cheap made these while these are not fancy at all these are just a lot better tuner uh, overall uh, the way they're made but they do fit the style of the guitar much better also and that's the main thing I wish I had the ferrules for this. It does look like maybe this had little ferrules on it at one time, maybe. I can't even really tell. In a place or two it for sure looks like it, but the rest of them, and I'd say three of them, look like they had ferrules on them. The rest of them don't, so I don't really know if it ever did or didn't. Well, that takes care of that. With the exception of the whiteness of this, I really like these. I think they're very good. They're just perfect. It's a shame they don't come in a little bit of an off-white to match the old bindings. That would make more sense, but you know, that's just the way it is. They fit the holes really tightly, so there's really not much need for a ferrule. Those real skinny ferrules could probably fit down in there, but I don't have any of them, so we can't go that route. And I'm not the guy that's going to drill it out and put these in there. I think I'll just go ahead and fill these holes. They uh, probably can use it also. They're probably pretty wallered out that over the years. They do that. There's a little bit of corrosion on the back side of this. Um, you know, a little more than just patina. I think I'm going to go ahead and knock a little bit of that off with with this semi-chrome polish. Not going to try to make it look brand new. Looking a little bit better. Like I said, I don't want to make it look brand new. Just trying to get rid of the stuff that's really dirty looking. There's also a slight bend in this and I don't think it's normal, but I'm not sure I want to deal with that. I don't know. I don't think I want to deal with that. It's not that bad, number one. If it was bigger, I'd probably would. Well, you know, it, it, it just looks cared for now again. It doesn't look like somebody completely uh, refinished it or something. It just looks clean, but yet worn, you know. That's the kind of look I'm going for. I never try to make them look like it's been totally restored or something. These are Phillips head screws, which I doubt are correct for this instrument. Off camera, I already filled these holes and then re-drilled them, so everything's good on that. As my friend Jeff Bradshaw always says, start them all before you tighten any. It's not a bad practice on most things. Jeff was gone from YouTube there for most of the year, seems like. He's been busy with other things. But he seems to be back again. I'm glad to see him back. He kind of helped me get going here at the beginning. Gave me a lot of pointers. When tightening down these kinds of screws, you go to they get good and snug and just a fraction of a turn past that and you're good. No point in keep spinning because you just strip them out. Well, let's see what it looks like with some strings on it.
Another thing that I like to do, whenever you start putting strings on these with these new bridges, you know, I've already showed you how I leveled the bottom feet and, and round, round the, those off, but all of the edges on this are very sharp, so I'm just going to take this apart. Before I do that, I have it set, so this is the treble side, so I'll just put a T here, and this is the bass side, so I'll put a B over here. And I know which way this goes based on the way it's cut. So anyway, I'm just going to take and knock off these sharp corners. So if your hand brushes up against it, you just don't feel it that way. It just feels really sharp. That feels better. This has got some sharp sharpness to it too, this piece. You know, I'm used to making these saddles for out of deer antler, and I do the same thing on them. I knock off all these corners, get rid of all the sharpness. Yes, this could be made out of deer antler. I know that'll be the next question. Uh, I'm not going to do that just because of tradition on this one. I, it, yes, I think it probably would improve the sound of it if we did do that, but I'm not going to do it. Plus, it just takes quite a while to make a custom one. Uh, the ones I make are all standard uh, for the mandolin, and it would be a longer process to make one for the guitar just because it would all be hand done where I don't have any setups for it. That feels good. Okay, there's the treble side. So this goes on like this. And let's go on from there. Someone had the right idea when they cut these pins off, but execution is everything. And you can see how sharp and jagged these are on the ends. I'm going to round them all off so that if they do hit the top here, they won't scratch it up like they've been scratching it up here. I'm also going to try to see how long I need to make them. If, yeah, I can kind of tell that by how far it sticks through here. Let's see if we can even get one in there. There it goes. Well, the length is about right, so I'm going to, I'm going to say the length is okay. I am going to round them off though. Um, not going to leave these jagged edges sticking down. I could do this on a sander. These are plastic, so it, they file pretty easy, and that sander would eat them up pretty fast. Well, I've already noticed something that I'm disappointed with. The uh, They turn backwards compared to the new modern tuners. Uh, these turn backwards. Now, the old ones did not turn backwards either. I'm just saying that these in this vintage style, the reproduction of it, they turn backwards. Now, you could say, well, you've got them on the wrong side. You turn them over there, then they'll turn the right way. That's true, but that throws the, the where these where the buttons are off. It puts the buttons way up here higher on the peg head. They don't look right. Everything looks wrong and it doesn't line up back here correctly where the old scar is. It's just the way they made them. They, you know, the old ones were uh, with the post above the worm gear and that's what these are. These, the, the post is above the worm gear and the old ones were like that. But, you know, it's just one of those deals where it's just, shortcutting everything to death and the quality is just crap these days so you know you get what you get it it sort of looks the part it just doesn't really work the part if you will i mean it's certainly workable and usable this way it's just disappointing I'm going to go ahead and get this all strung up. I'll uh, line this all up and then maybe put little tiny grooves in this to hold the strings. I don't have any grooves in there right now, but I don't want to put them in there until I get everything lined up. Action-wise, I'm impressed. This is just about the right height and everything. It's going to be just about perfect. So I'll get all the strings on here and, and we'll show you what that looks like. When I get down to doing things like this, I'll set the strings and make two marks and then I just go across and check all the marks and see if they're all about the same and they look good. I look up here to see if they're about the right width. They look good. The whole thing could maybe move that way just a hair and that caused that one to move a little bit on me there, unfortunately. Anyway, once I get them about right, then I just draw, take a fine pencil and draw on both sides of the string.
And then I just take it off and then I take a three cornered file and I, uh, you know, this is coming from the back and so I, you know, I want to have the angle up and I just lightly cut, ac cut across there, just lightly. And I don't want to cut a very deep groove. I just want a little bit of a groove. These bigger strings you have to do a little bit more. Maybe wallow it out just a little bit. But I'm not trying to go very deep. Deep is the thing I don't want to do. I just want it enough to hold the string. And I always want it at an angle up. I'm exaggerating, but I always want it up at an angle like this. That way the front edge is the last place the string touches. If it's not the last place it touches, it can vibrate in there and cause a problem. Those are those mystery buzzes that people bring to me and they can't find. A lot of times that's where they are at, is in the saddle. That's pretty close. Let me tune her up and check the intonation and we'll show you what it sounds like. I know you can't see what I'm doing here with the tuner, but I just thought I'd give you a refresher on intonation. When you, oh, you note it open and you get it as close as you can get to dead center on your tuner. And then you note it closed at the 12th fret. And it's way sharp, it's 30, 20 plus cents sharp. What that means is from here to here is too short. From here to here is too short. Sharp is short, meaning that the string is too short, so you need to move the bridge back. Now, when you get close, very little movement is all you need. Here I'm going to need maybe a sixteenth of an inch or more. It, and then you have to check it again. And you just have to keep doing that till you get it right. So now we'll check it again. still sharp. When you check this, you want to be careful that you're not bending your string up or down, just as lightly and straight down as you can touch it. Yeah, I'm still almost 20 cents, well, about 20 cents sharp. So that means that's still too short. Got to bring it back some more. It's bouncing around 10 cents sharp, so that still means it's short. It's getting closer though. About five cents or so sharp. Still sharp. That's good though, because every bit, every time we move this back, that raises this tail thing up, and there gets gives me more clearance right here, which I'm real happy about. Focus, focus, camera. There you go. I think. Well, it keeps fuzzing out on that, but anyway, you, I think you can see there's a clearance there now, which is good. So moving it back is actually a good thing in this case. You can see I'm back further than where it used to be, and that's you know that's just. Too bad somebody just didn't have it in the right place, that's all. Anyway, that's kind of common. Bridges work forward too over time, so you have to keep pulling them back over time. Right on the money, Sonny. A hair flat. So what that means is this side is too far back. When it's flat, it's far back. So you want to move it forward. And so I'm trying to keep this one where it's at and move this, this edge just a little bit. It doesn't have to go very far though, because it's not far off. So let's check that and see if we've improved it. Still a hair flat, let's double check the base side. on the money. Okay, so this side still needs to go forward a little bit without moving the base side. That might help a little bit. Check it again. Right on the money. 
So that's about as good as you're gonna get it on the intonation. You can just really only intonate these outer two strings. The only way you can intonate the middle strings is by compensating the, the bridge. We'll check it to see how far they are off. If there's any of them that are really far off, we'll do something. But I don't think that's gonna be the case here. Generally, it's not. So I'll finish tuning her up and show you what it sounds like. I've got her up to tune, and, and the action's really, really low. I, I've got, here's my 80 thousandths, and that's what I like to set it to, and it's picking it up pretty good. So it's only probably around, 65 70 thousandths right now so we're going to raise that up it is buzzing just a little bit right in here in order to raise this up i'm going to go ahead and loosen the strings you don't have to loosen them all the way but i'm going to loosen them some in order to raise this up and in this particular case i'm probably going to have to use the pliers to raise it i can't it's too tight to turn by hand and I try to get a hold of this very carefully. These pliers have teeth on them to grab the teeth on the ring. That's why I choose them so they don't slide. And then I just rotate it so that it's raising this up. Keep in mind, each one of these little turns that I'm making is only about an eighth of a turn or so. This will also be a good thing to get the tailpiece up off the top a little bit more. It's not touching now, but this will just make it better. Now we'll double check it with our gauge and see where we're at at the 12th fret. That's pretty darn close right there. It might even be just a hair high. It might just be a hair over the 80. And this is still right tight on 80. Let's so let's check the tuning and see if it buzzes. That's the main thing. Got a nice sound, real nice sound for an old guitar like this. Friends, if I was putting out one of those very highly produced videos like you see on some of the big channels, right about now you'd go, you'd hear the glass break and you'd go, uh oh, something happened. Well, it did. And the glass broke. <sighs> you know, I want to say this guitar is fixed and it's ready to go. And the odds are. It would probably last quite a long time, just like I have it here. It plays good, it sounds good, etc., and so forth. But I'm not satisfied. As I was stringing it up, bring it up to pitch, this top, I could just tell, was giving. You could hear it creaking, cracking, popping, all kinds of stuff as the pressure was applied to the strings way more than I should have heard. Then, as I'm getting it up to pretty close to full pitch, this crack is letting go again, you can tell. So the tight bond isn't really holding it in this particular case, and the reason I feel is that it was glued already, and glue doesn't stick to glue very well, etc. and so forth. So, Bottom line is, I could send this back to the customer the way it is, and more than likely I wouldn't have a very happy customer after a while. I've let it sit here in the shop for several days. I've already talked to the customer, and he's agreed that I should just go ahead and open it up and fix it. Wow. And I really, really hate to do that. <laughs> I mean, I really do. This is this back, you can look at it and see now it's rubbed and all that. It's you know it's war. But if you look at the crack, I mean there is no crack there. There's no binding on the back, but you can tell it's never been off. That back has never been off that guitar. You can see the fine line in there in places, but the back itself has never been off. You know, and it's never even been cracked anywhere that I can see. It doesn't look like it's even been repaired. Well, the bottom line is, I have to find a way to open that up. 
And boy, I hate to do that because really what you're doing is you're breaking a perfectly good joint. I mean, you're just breaking it. And you try to do as good as you can, and of course I will. But I just, I just dread it. And that's part of the reason it's been sitting in the shop here. Just with, It's been tuned up and, you know, it's holding tune relatively well, but I still just don't trust it. I'm really going to have to take it apart, get in there, clean the joint out, put some good cleats across there, etc., etc. I always say you need cleats whenever the joint is under stress. Well, this joint is definitely under stress. If there's no stress there, you know, to speak of, then the cleats aren't really going to do you much good. I got a comment on uh, one of my older videos uh, about a guitar just like this where I took the back off of it. And I don't remember the title of the video at the moment, but I'm sure you've all seen it. He made the comment in his, uh, on the video that you can take that back off with that hide glue much easier if you use alcohol. Well, wouldn't you know, I'm just getting ready to take this off this morning. And to be perfectly honest with you, I kind of forgot about the comment because uh, I get so many comments and I'm doing so many things, I forgot to relate it to to this guitar as I'm getting ready to work on it. Well, would you not know, just about the moment I'm ready to stick the knife in this thing, that gentleman calls me all the way from France. <laughs> I would have probably already had the knife in there had he not called. But anyway, so I, you know, I told him, I said, well, how do I get the alcohol in that joint if the joint's that tight? And he, you know, he says, well, syringe. And I'm going, well, I can't even get a syringe in this joint. This joint is perfectly 100% tight. He said, well, you will have to open it up a little bit. But once you can get it opened up a little bit, then, you know, you get the alcohol in there and it will do wonders. He says, you will hear it actually crystallizing and popping and whatever, and it'll just come loose. Hey, it's worth a shot. I'm, he says you have to use, they have a specific kind of alcohol that they use. And I asked him, I said, well, I don't know that I have that kind of alcohol. I said, I've got denatured alcohol and I've got just isopropyl alcohol. And he says, well, it has to be a 90 plus percent alcohol. So, you know, as close to 100 percent as possible. So I've got some isopropyl that's got an over 90 percent rating. And I'm going to try that and see, because I don't know what the denatured alcohol rating is. I have no idea. But anyway, we're going to give that a shot here and see if alcohol does anything on this hide glue. That would just be super awesome if it would just get rid of that joint where I don't have to pry it open. Because when you pry it open, you don't know what you're going to get. I mean, you could you could easily crack the wood, you know, and so if the alcohol would dissolve the glue and just pop it open, that would just be like that. So let's give it a shot and see what happens. All right, some of you might wonder what would be the process for getting this back opened up. Well, here's my thought process. I don't generally want to open it along this side, you know, as the first opening because this, you know, right-handed player, that's the thing you're going to be looking at all the time. So if you're going to have to make a mark, put it somewhere you, where you won't see it. Around the tail end is a good place in one regard, but then it's a bad place to start in another regard. Two reasons on this guitar. Number one, there's a seam right there and you're just going to make that seam get worse. And the tail block's there, so it's harder to get something in there because it's glued in a bigger surface area. This neck heel is not a good place to start because you could break that off real easy, and, th and there's a lot of glued up area here. So if we can't do any of this area, basically, from, from here to here, then the only place is left is down here. And so that's where I'm looking. I'm, I'm looking for a place that just might possibly be loose but I don't see anything, to be perfectly honest with you. But I'm gonna choose right about here. I can see, and one of the, the main reason I'm choosing this is I can see the seam very clearly. I'm going to try to get a razor blade in that crack. It's, I can already tell it's gonna be an ugly one because you can see the finish cracking as I'm, as I'm putting pressure on that crack. It's just not gonna to wanna to do it. So what I'm trying to do here, one of my wonderful viewers sent me these little bottles with the little tiny needle on it. It's almost as tiny as a syringe. And I'm just going to, now that I've just poked my knife blade in there, I'm just going to put alcohol on there and see if by chance it will do something to that glue. 
I doubt it, uh, just because I don't have very bit much of an opening there. But you never know, might get lucky, and you know, he says it works really good. The alcohol doesn't seem to be affecting the old finish any, which is wonderful. And I'll just keep it soaked down for a little while. And I'm seeing that the alcohol seems to be penetrating that crack. I don't know if you can see it on camera or not, but the alcohol does actually seem like it's um, finding a way down in that crack because it dries up right on the crack line. If I don't put too much there, it's hard not to put too much there. It runs out so easily. But if I can get just a little bit there, you can see it kind of going down in there. I'm thinking maybe it'll work. Just going to let that set and soak and keep putting alcohol on it for the next 10 minutes or so just to see what happens. I don't, I don't figure there's any real reason to get in a hurry or anything. I've been uh, working this knife blade in this same spot now for 10 minutes or so. Keep putting the alcohol in here. Can't say as I've really seen anything happen yet. I uh, really would like to see something happen because that would be awesome, but at the moment I just don't see anything going on. The alcohol is soaked in there because as I work the blade in there, I can see the alcohol squishing around in the wood. I keep working it in there, you know, thinking that maybe it's going to eventually soften it in front of it or back of it or something and it's going to start coming loose, but so far, nothing. You know, it's one of those deals where maybe I'm just not holding my mouth right, you know. You can see it's squished in there, maybe. And uh, it's holding it. It's kind of super saturated with it. I would certainly think it would be about time for it to start turning loose here, if it was going to turn loose. And I don't expect it to hold back to come loose, but I was expecting maybe the crack would open up just a little bit. And I haven't seen even any sign of that so far. I'm not going to give up on it yet because I definitely want to find a way to do this better where I don't damage this at all. Well, I'm having, I would call it mixed results with this. I know it's sort of working, but I'm spending a ton of time on this. The alcohol is not just making it instant like he's let it you know i i'm not saying that's what he said exactly but i think he said it was pretty pretty quick you know and it's not quick at all at least not in this case um i've spent quite a long time on this i soaked it and 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 then i went to lunch you know let it soak for a while came back i uh, didn't really notice any difference in the cracks I just started more or less forcing the uh, knife down in there. Actually, I heated this little knife first and forced it in there pretty far. That started the crack moving a little bit. I've been putting more alcohol in there and more or less manhandling it, forcing it to open, really. It's not opening on its own, if you will. I'd say it's probably helping a little. The only thing that I can say positive right now is it does look like it's following the crack really well. It doesn't look like it's varying off. Sometimes it will do that. It'll, it'll, it'll splinter off or split, but right now it does look like it's following the exact crack of the uh, top there, which is good. Um, I'm just soaking the alcohol down in there. The alcohol is actually soaking into the crack about this far ahead of me. And I'm just trying to work this large, flat, really thin blade that direction. We'll just have to keep at it and see how it works. But, uh, you know, I'm not so sure it's a magic bullet. But on the other hand, I'm going to try to continue on and take the whole top off with this method and see if it's a clean removal. If it's a clean removal, that's a big plus right there because most of the time they're not perfectly clean.
Just when I was getting a little more comfortable and confident with this process, I think I wouldn't say disaster struck because it would happen the other way too, but it, it kind of left the seam here and it started going into the side, which does happen. So you got to be careful with that. So I stopped going this direction. What I'm going to have to do now is get above this and work my way back to it. Otherwise, it's just going to continue to follow the grain line. So I'll have to get above it and work my way that way. Uh, it just never quits. You do want to keep the alcohol wiped off. The one place here where I didn't wipe it off, it did eat into the finish a little bit. There's no magic bullet here. It seems like it does help a little bit, but only very little in my opinion. I really think I'd be just as far ahead or probably further along if I was heating the knife up real hot and sliding it in there. So I don't know if I'm going to continue doing this or not. It's it's working, but it's not working that great. In the area here where it is working, I thought it was real clean, but I can see some tear out in there too, so I don't even think it's doing all that clean of a job where it is working. So, I don't know. We're just going to have to back up five and punt here, I think. Well, friends, to you, it's just a mere second, but for me, it's been several days. I had to put this on hold because of Christmas and other projects. I had a recording project to do and a few other things, and I just didn't get back to it. So I want to just kind of bring you up to where I feel like I'm at on this. I've spent more than an hour trying to get this loose with the alcohol. That's a new process. I didn't charge the customer at all for that amount of time. It's a new process. I was trying it out and to see if it would work. The fellow from France, very nice fellow. I'm sure that he knows what he's talking about. I'm not knocking him at all, but it just doesn't work for me. Now, it could be a couple of things. It could be the kind of alcohol I'm using. I'm using isopropyl alcohol. I tried denatured alcohol also. I have that here too. And it's not doing the trick. I mean, it's sort of kind of working. And I'm, you know, this little syringe is really nice. It's a very small needle, as you can probably see there. Very tiny needle. And uh, it's it gets it right down in the crack and all that. So, and you know, that alcohol, it spreads and it runs everywhere. It's so thin. So that's not the issue. It's not getting it on there. I'm getting it on there. I don't know. I'm just about to give up on the alcohol idea, though. It, you know, I, I am positive that this has not been taken apart before. This is the first time this has been taken apart. So because of the age, I'm almost guaranteeing that it is high glue. You know, it just is what it is. It doesn't seem to be working for me. I don't know why. The only way I can justify it is I can't even get gravity to work half the time. So there you go. It's just one of them things. So I'm going to go back to the hot knife method and uh, we will start the clock now because I do know this method works and we will uh, get this back off of here. You know, if I kept going with the alcohol, um, you know, if it took me more than an hour to do this much, uh, you know, it's going to be a thousand dollars time I get the back of this thing off of here. You know, it's going to be ridiculous. Uh, so I got to get it off here fairly quickly and we're going to change our tactics and give it a shot. Here we go. Well, we got the back off of there. Um, I quit filming it just because it eats up too much film. But, uh, you know, you just take your time and go around there. For the most part, it came apart really good. Ironically, the worst place it looks to me like is right here where it chipped out pretty good. And that was the area that I started with the alcohol. Um, just to give you a comparative figure with the alcohol, and again, like I said, I'm not knocking that process. I'm just saying somehow it didn't seem to be working for me. If you look at it, about this much here was done with alcohol, and that took me roughly an hour. Then uh, I did the rest of this in 35 minutes. So I did the whole rest of it in 35 minutes. And yeah, there's a little damage there, but there was damage where the alcohol was too. So. You know, actually it came off pretty good. You can't hardly get these things apart like this without some damage. 
just almost impossible. I mean, you probably could if you spent hours and hours and hours and hours, but keep in mind, I'm building at $80 an hour. So I basically got this off of here for roughly $40 versus if it would have taken me eight hours the other way times 80, that's you know a lot of money, 640 bucks. You gotta do what you gotta do. You'll suffer a little bit more damage by hurrying up a little bit, but on the other hand, I know how to fix damaged wood. Now, that's the good news. We got it apart. The bad news is it's, it's a tough fix. It really is. It, ordinarily, when you get these open like this, okay, it's easy to fix. This one's not easy to fix. The, the main crack that I'm wanting to fix is right along here and right along here. And I mean they're right against the, the brace. I can see a crack along this one in here. There's a, another bigger crack here. This crack here won't be too bad to fix. Uh, getting the tight bond in there, it did work its way all the way through there, you can see, but it had already been glued with the hide glue, and the hide glue has worked its way through the crack also. Tight bond, just like most other glues, don't stick to glue very well. About the only glue that sticks to itself well is uh, you know, CA glue. Otherwise, for the most part, glue doesn't stick to glue very well. Think on this a little bit, because to be honest, it's not an easy fix. It's already got glue in the crack, so it's almost impossible to clean the crack out. If I do clean the crack out, I'm gonna damage it more. People just think, oh, it's so simple, just do it. Well, it's not simple. You know, if you think it's simple, then you don't know what you're talking about. It's just not simple. If it had never been fixed before, then to me, it's simple. I could do it, wouldn't even think twice about it. But because it's already been re-glued and it's got glue in the crack now, and the crack is so close to this brace where I can't really span the crack with cleats, I don't know what I'm gonna do to fix it. But I'm gonna figure it out and we'll find some way to fix it. I'm making some cleats to go across the crack that's near the neck. I'm making them one inch long roughly because that's about how much room I have to work with and I say the bigger the better on this particular cleat because <clears throat> this cleat is gonna go up here where there's a lot of stress. That's right on both sides of the neck and there's a lot of stress on that neck. So that joint there takes a lot of stress. That's probably why it broke to begin with. So we're gonna really cleat that heavily uh, now that we have it apart here and we're gonna clamp that up good and make sure that the cleats fit that really well. And we've got about a, roughly a little bit more than a half an inch from this brace to the crack. So therefore, I'm making the cleat an inch long where it'll go almost to the touch this brace here and go up through there. And I made the cleats out of spruce and it's very finely quarter sawed spruce that so you can see the grain lines running through it this way. But that'll be, those grain lines will be perpendicular to the top. And that way they won't split again. Where if I put them in this way, they would split. This way they won't split. Sorry about the background noise. Ron's in the other room making deer antler saddles. The uh, cleats I've got sitting here um, will fit in these two locations. I've also taken a straight edge and scraped the top here to clean it up and to flatten it off so that the cleats match up really well. I believe this is gonna be very strong. And then I'm going to take it back off to see how well the glue is making contact. Well, I think I'm gonna take it back off. It looks like it's making pretty good contact because it doesn't wanna come off. Yeah, that made 100% contact there. So it looks really good. I'm gonna put just a teeny bit more glue on it just to make sure that it makes contact again. So that should hold those really well. I put leather on this one. This one already had leather on the clamp. So that should really hold those very well. 
I'm gonna let that glue sit up after a couple hours and we'll take the clamps off. Meanwhile, I'm going to, I've already started devising an idea to work on these other parts here. I've made myself a triangular embrace. Now this is triangular at the moment and it will still be triangular when I'm done, but it'll be much smaller. I'm just, you know, trying to figure out a way to get in here and glue this crack solid. And I've also cut the grain lines so that this shouldn't split also. Um, the difference with this one is that this is a carved arch area here. I want to span the whole thing with one piece of wood rather than, I want to go this full length because that crack goes that full length and I want to tie it to this brace and I want to tie it to the top. And it may take a lot of hand fitting to get it there. You know, I mean, because this brace is carved at an angle. I mean, it's nothing simple on this. It really isn't simple. The brace itself is like a pyramid, so I can't just lay something in there square and expect it to match up. We'll have to carve this to, to fit this and the top both. So I'm just kind of monkeying with it right now to see how long I need. About right there should be long enough, so we're gonna cut it off to get the extra length out of my way. This will bend a little bit, so I can flex it in there if I have to. But I think what I'm gonna do is carve the end off of it so I don't have to flex it too much. You can probably see on the profile there how I'm thinning that down to match this curve under there. It's better, but still got a ways to go. That's really not looking too bad. I'm gonna clean it up with some files and make it look smoother. Uh, you know, I just don't want it to look like somebody carved it with a pocket knife. Well, I would admit to trying a bunch of different ideas on clamping this off camera. I think I've settled on this arrangement here. I've got pads on the underside, on the which would be the top. Well, as a matter of fact, I'll just show you. You can see there's leather pads in all those locations. I have leather pads taking up some of the slack here because this is sloped and so the, the uh, clamp wants to slide down this brace. So these leather pads here kind of catch it about halfway on the brace and push the brace in and keep it from sliding any further. It seems to be working pretty well. This is a dry run. I have not glued it yet. So there's no time like the present. Let's glue it up. You know, I had to carve it in there and make it fit. And that's that's a compound angle because that brace is... It looks good, but you know sad thing is? What? Only nope. you and me are the only two that's ever going to see it. Well, except for <laughs> the thousand people watching it on video. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, this looks a little bit like a Rube Goldberg deal, but uh, you can see I have a lot of different things going in a lot of different directions there. This weird piece of wood going across here is just so that I could put this little extra stick in here. You can't really see it very good, but this little pry stick is prying down on that brace to push it down just in one more spot there. And uh, the rest of it seems pretty tight. It was just a little bit up right there. It's, uh, it looks airtight all the way around, uh, so I think it's as good as it can be done. You can see I've made another brace just like this one on this side. This one's already glued in place. I've got this one dry clamped in place. It looks like it fits up really tight, and I think that's the only way we're gonna fix those cracks that are right along those braces. I don't think there's any other way to fix it. Not without taking the braces completely out and doing something else, but that's just more destruction and create more problems. I think you can see how I've got this one all clamped up down in there. There's a good amount of glue squeeze out all through there. It really looks very tight. I think it's just about as good as it can be. We'll about 
be ready to put the backpack on this thing. Just thought while we've got this thing open, I'd point out a few things. You can see I do have the second brace in there and I've tidied it all up. I went through and really looked at it close and you know, I, I carved away a little bit more wood to you know, lighten it up and uh, smoothed it off some. And you know, like there was a place or two where there was just the slightest, you know, air gap. And so I took CA glue today, which is the second day now. It's uh, dried overnight. I wanted to give the other glue time to really set up good. And then any little tiny air gap, I filled it with CA glue. So these braces are really tight in there now. They don't, there's, there's no vibration or rattle. I don't think the top will ever give again now, uh, at least not in those same two places. The hole right here, which I don't know why they drilled it in there, but it is an actual hole. It does go all the way through that you can see. I mean, I could plug that after I get it back together too, but, and uh, I would also just point out that you can see that, you know, it's very obvious, it's just two long braces. There was never any evidence of a ladder brace going across anywhere. You can see that, that there's, absolutely no evidence that any other braces were made there. As far as I can tell, everything else inside is perfectly sound. I'm not crazy about this neck joint up here. Uh, you can see it's got a lot of air space in there. And, you know, it's solid, it's tight. And as the old adage goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I don't think I'm going to do anything with that. It's held this long and I don't see any reason to feel like it won't hold again. I think we're gonna call her good and start putting her back together. Well, I did notice one more thing. I actually saw this before and I'd forgotten about it. And that is that this back has split here and it's the crack is opened up through here. I can tell that someone has tried to fix it. It's smooth all the way up to here, but where this crack is opened up, you can feel glue squeeze out. So somebody's already tried to re-glue it. It's been, you know, it was glued originally, re-glued. Re-gluing it again is, it's that old definition of insanity. Keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. It's got to be fixed. You know, at the risk of making it worse, I'm going to try to get the old glue out of there, which I hate to do because it usually makes the crack wider and makes it look uglier. But if you can get it back to bare wood, it'll, it'll hold much better. I'm just taking the back edge of an X-Acto knife, using it as a scraper, lifting up, typically pulls most of that out of there. You can see it coming out in chunks. The back edge of the X-Acto knife is very square and very kind of sharp in its own right. And it makes a great scraper for things like this. Hope, my hope is by doing it from the inside, I won't make as big a mess on the outside. No, it doesn't look too bad from the outside. You can't really hardly tell it so far, so that's good. Yeah, I can see it. I can see it all the way up into here now. So it's really going a long ways up in there. That should work. I've got the clamp attached here. Um, it's very simple. You just attach it on both sides by screwing this down with the thumb screws. And then this will tighten it up. So you just start cranking it together and you can already see the glue squeeze out. It's already starting to come out. And that really pulls it in tight. All the way down through there you can see glue squeeze out. That's a very good way to do it. I would imagine we'll see glue squeeze out on the other side, sure enough. And I had already cleaned that up, so that's a good sign that there's plenty of glue in there. Much better chance of that holding now that I got in there and scraped that to bare wood. And, you know, you can't be 100% sure it's to bare wood, but it's certainly better than just gluing it in there without even scraping it at all. Since we're this far into it and we've got it apart, we might as well go ahead and cleat this joint since it's broke a couple of times, it's obvious. If it had never, you know, been re-glued, I probably wouldn't even bother cleating it. Um, as you can see, the rest of the joint's fine past where the block is. The block goes right in here, so we'll start about here and go down and put maybe two or three small cleats. 
Well, that should hold that. It's just an added security there. They were already stuck pretty good. The glue was tacky. And we'll just let that set for an hour and rest. And then we'll clean those little patches up, bevel them down, make them smaller. You know, you just don't want to leave clunky stuff inside your instrument. And then I think, then we really are ready to put it back together. I've done a dry test fit and everything fits up pretty nice. I might point out that this uh, has a nail uh, in this area right here. It's pointed up and it also helps locate it. Boy, it's a sharp one too. It sticks up pretty high too. Looked at it really close and it seems to fit up pretty well. I'm going to be using Type Bond Original to put it back, and some people will say immediately that that is stupid, you shouldn't use that because this was glued with hide glue, and they say you can't take this apart, hide glue you can take apart. Well, let me just show you a close-up. Does the hide glue look like it came apart real easy? You know, it didn't. Um, I, you know, it chipped out all over the place. It's better to even show it on this side. You can see that it actually cut the uh, wood more than it came loose on the glue and you know obviously the original was high glue and you can see that it basically cut the wood more than it actually unglued it so you know the the myth about taking high glue apart as being easy is is a myth this is also a myth that you can't take this apart with with heat i can take this apart just as easy as high glue and probably easier um, now this is the original. You can't use Type Bond 2 and all those other things and get that apart with heat very easy. But this stuff comes apart just fine with heat. So, you know, if you don't like that, all I can tell you is go lump it because it works great. The other thing about it is that it holds like iron, you know, and uh, it will hold it very well. And you won't have to worry about it coming loose in the meantime. I believe that'll do. We'll let that set overnight. Get back at it tomorrow. Well, my friends, we've got her back together. You can see I wiped down the whole thing with linseed oil and dried it back off. So it just makes it look better. It really does make it look better. And I think it's good for these old finishes. I don't know that it'll show up in the video, but there's just eggshell all over this finish everywhere. I mean, there's not a place that doesn't have eggshell. Uh, you know, little tiny fine cracks. So I think wiping it down with the linseed oil helps that a lot keeps it from getting worse and I think it preserves the finish. I had to use some filler along these edges, uh, you know, just from, you know, you're really using a lot of force to get it apart because you can always tell it. I don't care, you know, you know how good you do it, you can tell it. But it's done well, it's done as well as I can do it and it doesn't look horrible, it just, you know, is what it is. And, uh, you know, in this case, I believe the back had to come off. I don't think that was fixable through the sound hole at all because the cracks were right against those braces. And I do think it's solid as a brick now. You know, I'm using the flesh. I don't use, ever use, never let your fingernail do that. You can tell it's just solid as a brick. It's, uh, I'm going to string her back up and we'll play her for you. It was another tough fight, Ma, but we won. You know, it hurts me like crazy to take the backs off of these old instruments, but on the other hand, you gotta do what you gotta do, and you just have to make it hurt for a little while, but then it gets better, you know? And we're at the point where it's better. In terms of the sound, we'll just let you hear it first. sound all together than the flat top guitars. It's a little on the subdued side compared to a couple I've heard and you some of you will say well that's your brace the way you put your bracing in there you know to fix that brace. Well it's not. It, it I heard it before I put the bracing in there and it's about the same. It really didn't change it much at all. 
if it changed it at all, I don't hear it. So it's got a decent sound. It's, it's just not as loud as some I've heard. But it's not bad. It's got a good sustain. It, you know, rings. It's solid now. I didn't hear any popping, cracking noises stringing it up that time where before I did. Boy, I mean, it just kept making noises and weird stuff. But now it's solid. That top, I would bet that top will last longer than the rest of it now. I don't think that's going to be an issue anymore. When I get an old guitar like this in my hand, I think of old tunes. And uh, Jimmy Rogers obviously was one of the best. They uh, call him, some of them call him the father of uh, the country music. Uh, I think he was also known as the brakeman, something like that, because I believe he was a brakeman on a railroad line, something like, something to that line. I don't listen, I don't check out history, guys, so don't get on me if I'm wrong on that. But anyway, he wrote some cool songs. And uh, I don't think the YouTube cops will get on me on this one um, because a lot of these lines are borrowed from a lot of different songs. Or, so hopefully I can get away with this one. But you never know. Here we go. It's not the last song he wrote. He wrote it about the disease that killed him. But uh, it was among the last songs that he wrote. The TB Blues. My good gal's trying to make a fool out of me. fool out of me He's trying to make me believe I ain't got the old TB I got the TB blue When it rained down sorrow it rained all over me Lord, Lord When it rained down sorrow rained all And now my body rattles like a train on the old SP. I got the TB blue. Got the TB blue. The TB blues by the great late Jimmy Rogers. Hey, you know, it didn't turn out too bad. You can still see those places that other people had worked on it and stuff. And, you know, it's been banged around. Hey, you know, it's 100 years old. I hope I look this good at 100 years old. <laughs> I'd like to make it to 100 years old. Thank you for watching. Tell your friends. Be sure to click that subscribe button and be sure to ring that little bell after you click the subscribe button and uh, you'll be notified of future videos that I put out. Kill a troll by clicking that thumbs up. Thank you very much for watching.